Hi, I'm Eric Voss, and Black Panther is one of the most entertaining, richly designed, must-watch Marvel movies ever. Kinda felt like Martin Freeman in this movie. Oh boy, I'm just gonna enjoy this. But if you rewatch Black Panther closely, there are a ton of subtle, interesting choices by director Ryan Coogler and his whole creative team that make this film so great. Cultural influences, the look of this film, missable connections to the other films of the Marvel world. So join me as I uncover all of these details and Easter eggs, whatever you wanna call them. And of course, spoiler warning, if you haven't seen seen Black Panther yet, unless, you know, you prefer to watch a movie with a nerd talking you through it. And if so, what's wrong with you? Let's get started. Okay, so this movie begins with this interesting prologue, taking the form of a story told from father to son, showing us the history of Wakanda and its people while the outside world descends into war and slavery. And right away, we get a taste of this film's spectacular production design. Notice how this history is depicted with grains of dark sand. Hannah Beachler, the production designer, said she wanted to think about how an African nation might have evolved with vibranium-enriched soil, and that this sand would be something that links the modern day Wakandans to their ancestors thousands of years ago. We actually see this granular vibranium show up again a few scenes later when T'Challa uses it to display the truck convoy containing Nakia in the jungle below. This prologue firmly establishes Black Panther with its own distinct voice and identity, but also in a way it does echo past Marvel movies. The first two Thor movies, remember, opened with similar narrative prologues from a hidden world's patriarch, in that case, Odin, to catch us up on the whole origin story. You know, the, the super interesting one that we all uh, think about all the time, like frost giants and whatnot. But then we move on from this prologue to 1992 Oakland, California, which we learn through this interesting title text on the screen. It translates from the Wakandan language into English. And I like how it translates this movie's role as translating this new Wakandan nation and society from something foreign to us to something we understand. The design team created a whole new Wakandan alphabet. And like most design elements of this movie, they rooted it in ancient African traditions. In this case, these letters resemble the characters of Nsibidi, an ancient cuneiform from Nigeria. By the way, the spoken Wakandan language is Hosa, which is a dialect known for the clicks that I'm probably not getting at all correct. It's based in South Africa, figures like Nelson Mandela spoke it. Also, the choice to set this flashback scene in Oakland is no coincidence either. Oakland is director Ryan Coogler's hometown. It was a setting for his directorial debut, Fruitvale Station, and it has its own historical significance as the birthplace of the Black Panther Party in the 60s. Actually, if you look closely inside Njobu's apartment, there are posters for early 90s rap groups like NWA and Public Enemy, both of whom adopted many of the Black Panther Party's messages into their lyrics. And on this TV screen is news footage showing the Rodney King riots. Now, I'll talk more about how these political and cultural influences work into the character dynamics later on, but a few more interesting details I want to point out here. The actor who plays the younger version of T'Chaka is Atwanda Kani, the real-life son of John Kani, who plays the older T'Chaka. Meanwhile, the young version of Zuri is played by Denzel Whitaker, who is related to Forrest Whitaker, but did work with him in the movie The Great Debaters. His character describes the Dora Milaje guards outside as Grace Jones looking chicks. Grace Jones was a Jamaican singer and actress with a similar look as the Dora Milaje. Moving on to the modern day with T'Challa rescuing Nakia in the African jungle. Here we meet Okoye, Denai Guerrera from The Walking Dead. She's the general of the Dora Milaje. Notice the tattoos on her bald head. The makeup team designed those to resemble the shape of a fighter pilot's helmet. But in addition to this militaristic look, they also gave her eye makeup to look look more feline to show her devotion to Black Panther. So later, when duty calls, ultimately her heart goes with the panther. As T'Challa drops out of the ship, we also see the Kamoyo beads in action. Now, these are from the recent Black Panther comics by Tahna Hisi Coates and Brian Steelfries. Steelfries designed them as a multi-purpose technology used for light communication and health and weaponry, with a look that roots them in traditional African jewelry. This particular comic series was hugely influential for this screen adaptation of Black Panther, and I'll talk more about that in a bit, but first you may have also been wondering what exactly Nakia was doing down there. Black Panther is rescuing her, but she's actually on a rescue mission of her own, saving these young women as well as a young male soldier. I think this is meant to reflect the current crisis in Western Africa, where the terrorist group Boko Haram kidnapped hundreds of Nigerian schoolgirls. The group is also known for kidnapping young boys and brainwashing them into child soldiers. So this mission establishes Nakia as more globally conscious than her Wakandan people, seeking to use her resources to intervene in international crises. Now we will see how this philosophy puts her, in a way, on the similar side of the spectrum as Killmonger against T'Challa's isolationist mindset, and how those two will be responsible for moving T'Challa to more of a middle ground. Moving on, these three return to Wakanda, hidden in plain sight by what looks like a camouflage dome. 
of reminds me a lot of the way the island of Themyscira was masked in Wonder Woman. Now, I'm not saying either ripped off the other, it's just that there's this interesting parallel for these two game-changing heroes from hidden utopias. Now, the city is also taking design influences from that recent Black Panther comic that I mentioned, and what made that series distinctive was the way Ta-Nehisi Coates embraced a concept called Afrofuturism. Afrofuturism is a concept in philosophy, art, and literature that examines racial themes through the lens of science fiction an idealized, advanced future that still embraces elements of present-day culture. So, while the city contains massive, futuristic skyscrapers, which, by the way, the design team said that they borrowed from Blade Runner, if you look closely at the tops of those skyscrapers, there are rondevels, the traditional African hut roofs. Also, down on the street level, in addition to the magnetized levitation elevated train that zips through the city, there's a slower trolley that rolls around, which may have been inspired by the Bay Area trolleys that Ryan Coogler grew up with. The overall effect of this is a futuristic sci-fi world that feels like it could have plausibly evolved from an undisturbed African culture over thousands of years. Something alive and lived in and practical. Also, can we make this place a part of Disneyland already? Because I, I, I want to go to there. This Afrofuturist approach was also snuck into the design of the jet that they're flying in. If you look closely from the bottom up, this jet was made to look like an African tribal mask, with the engines as eye holes. That gives an even deeper meaning to the looks that those boys in Oakland gave the jet as it hovered over them. T'Challa greets his mother, Queen Ramonda, played by Angela Bassett, and his sister Shuri, played by Letitia Wright, and both of these characters have some very interesting design details. Notice how Ramonda wears a traditional cylindrical Zulu hat, and a white circular shoulder mantle. Veteran costume designer Ruth Carter 3D printed all these, wanting the hat to look like an impressive crown from every angle, north, east, south, and west, considering several tribes would be seeing her from all sides. And she wanted the mantle to look like a setting sun behind her to reflect the state of mourning of the sun setting on her marriage. Meanwhile, Carter pointed out Shuri's interesting braids as a key reflection of her character. Notice how in every scene, Shuri's braids take a new shape and she wears a new wardrobe. She actually has the most costume changes of any character in this movie. This is all to show that she's a trendsetter and a fashion-forward princess of Wakanda. Checking in on London, where we meet Michael B. Jordan as Killmonger, my favorite character in this movie, perhaps the best villain we've seen so far in the MCU. His exchange with the museum curator establishes his philosophy as a villain. He isn't just motivated by revenge or power, he sees it as his mission to correct the mass oppression of his race, the pillaging of their natural resources, exploiting his ancestors themselves as resources in the slave trade, and as his father points out in the later flashback, the ongoing oppression into the modern day. And while N. Jadaka's aims to militarize his race with Wakanda technology to violently overthrow society might be too extreme, his anger is totally justified. He's not crazy or wrong, he's just too extreme. And by establishing the villain with this philosophy, Ryan Coogler links this dynamic between Njadaka and T'Challa with the debate at the heart of the civil rights movement. On one side, followers of Martin Luther King Jr. preach civil unrest and peaceful protest, symbolic gestures. Meanwhile, followers of Malcolm X believed in action and fighting back against an oppressive regime, even violently if necessary, an approach Njadaka has definitely embraced. These themes are explored deeply in the films of Spike Lee in his Malcolm X biopic and Do the Right Thing, which, by the way, Ruth Carter designed the costumes for. This debate actually goes back to the early days of the civil rights movement, to scholars like W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington, who had opposing views on the means of African American advancement. Shout out to Dr. Dantzler on Twitter for that. The takeaway of all this is, Ryan Coogler was able to use history to make the fight between the superhero and supervillain thematically important. They aren't just two men fighting over a throne, they're forces fighting over an ideal. And it's surprising how the movie answers that question. It's just one of the many reasons Black Panther is resonating with audiences so strongly. Back in Wakanda, T'Challa ascends to the throne through this ritual at Warrior Falls. Now notice how the five Wakandan tribes wear different wardrobes, hairstyles, and accessories. Now these all correspond to real-life African cultures. Ryan Coogler spent a month in Africa writing the script for Black Panther and doing a ton of research. The production designer actually created a 500-page Wakandan Bible explaining the whole design and cultural influences of the world of Wakanda. Going through these tribes, there's the Border Tribe, headed by Daniel Kaluuya as Wakabi. This tribe wears a lot of blue and they use wood. They're inspired by the people of Lesotho, who wear Basotho blue. 
blankets. This tribe features body scarification inspired by the Mercy and Bumi tribes of Ethiopia. Then there's the River Tribe, of which Nakia is a member. They wear green with shells as part of their patterns. Their leader is played by Isaac Debankole, who wears a large lip disc piercing. Lip plating is another detail pulled from the Mercy of Ethiopia. Then there's the Merchant Tribe. They wear white, inspired by Nigerian cultures. The Mining Tribe wears red, inspired by the Himba Tribe of Namibia, famous for treating their hair with red clay, which you can see in their leader's braids. And then there's the main Black Panther Tribe. They wear black and purple, colors derived from the black vibranium colors and the purple-colored heart-shaped herb, the sources of this tribe's strength. Traditional body scarification also inspired the glowing inner lip tattoo that Wakandans have, as well as Killmonger's self-applied scars. They were pulled from the Surma tribe of Ethiopia. Now, the tribe outside these five is the Mountain Tribe, the Jabari, led by M'Baku. He's played by Winston Duke. Now, in the comics, M'Baku is known as Man-Ape. They changed it to avoid any racial connotation, but they kept his gorilla iconography with his gorilla skull mask. Now, the production designer said that she modeled this Warrior Falls location on real-life settings like Glide Canyon, where the rocks are shelled in a way to block you in, creating a natural cage match for warriors to have nowhere to go. Moving on, T'Challa retakes the heart-shaped herb fluid from Zuri and transcends into the Ancestral Plane, which could be based on Dejalia from the Black Panther comics. It's a realm where the living can commune with the dead. Here he communes with his past ancestors in the form of these panther spirits, as well as his father, T'Chaka. Communing with his ancestors as spirit guides is actually something Black Panther does do in the comics. Okay, let's jump ahead to this scene with T'Challa and Shuri in her lab. The teacher Wright is so great in this movie. She seems to be embracing Q from the 007 movies, and she just has some of the best jokes in the movie. Like when she looks down at her brother's royal sandals and screams, What are those? What are those? Then she gives T'Challa a new pair of boots that are fully automated, like the old American movie their dad used to watch. She's referencing Marty McFly's self-lacing shoes in Back to the Future Part 2. And then later on, Shuri makes another movie reference to Ross, who asks, Is this Wakanda? And she jokes, No, it's Kansas. Referencing that, um, obscure movie that I think was called, uh, well, it's what The Wiz was based on. I, I don't know, I've never heard of this. Now, one of the suit designs she shows T'Challa has a gold trim, similar to the design her father wore in the opening scene. This could be a nod to the gold trim Black Panther suit from the comics in the 90s. The new suit Shuri gives him, with the shock-absorbing kinetic energy tech, has some Wakandan runes on it. This could be a reference to the run in the comics when Black Panther moves away from vibranium technology, instead using magic as the source of his powers. Really, what I love most about this lab is the overall design of the layout. It's located inside the vibranium mine of Mount Bashenga, which is named after the first Wakandan king that we saw in the prologue. The central walkway of the lab is shaped like a spiral, almost like a giant drill that's drilling into this mountain. Actually, I should point out that all of the design of the Wakandan palace is based on circular shapes the throne, the jets, the overall architecture, the floor layout. The designers did this to set Wakanda apart from the mountain tribe, whose architecture features more sharp angles. The idea being that Wakanda is a more community-based union of tribes, whereas the mountain tribe diverges on their own angular tangent. Okay, moving on to Busan, South Korea. Now, once again, the color of the characters' wardrobes carries a lot of symbolic weight here. Nakia, T'Challa, and Okoye are wearing green, black, and red, respectively. In a breakdown of the scene that he did for Vanity Fair, Ryan Coogler said that no other characters wear red or green in this scene. He wanted these three to stand out because red, black, and green are the colors of the Pan-African flag. Martin Freeman, CIA agent Everett Ross, returns here at the same table as Stan Lee, making a cameo as a gambler who takes T'Challa's ships for safekeeping. Okoye has to wear a wig disguised to blend in, which frustrates her because the Dora Milaje's shaved heads is a point of pride for them. But notice how later when fighting, she pulls off the wig and tosses it in a dude's face. According to Kugler, this is an example of traditionalism versus innovation in this scene, with female characters using their femininity as a weapon. So while Okoye takes out these guys with traditional spear movements, the wig becomes a weapon too. Similarly, down below, notice how Nakia pulls off her heel and beats a guy with it. Now, the second half of this casino fight is shot in one awesome, long, extended take. This is actually a director trademark of Ryan Coogler. In the movie Creed, he shot an entire boxing match in one four and a half minute long take. And this is super effective because it brings us into the action, having us experience all of this in real time, just like the characters are. And during this, you can hear this interesting yip vocals. Doing a yip, like a choo, 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 choo. This is the music 
music of Dora Q, a group of women singers from Senegal. And at the end of this tracking shot, Ulysses Claw punctuates it by using his arm cannon to blow up the cash box. Kind of like the confetti to celebrate the end of this shot. In the comics, Claw actually has a similar sonic arm cannon that fires these sonic blasts. He also at one point gets sucked into a machine and turned into a form made of entirely sound energy. Uh, yeah, I'm glad that they didn't go too far with that. The action spills outside, leading to this great car chase through the streets of Busan. It's interesting how elaborate Shuri's mapping technology is. Not only can she control the Lexus remotely back in her lab, the lab hollow projects the car's interior, and the surrounding city street as it passes by all into her view. Kind of like a 3D Google Street View. Now in the scene it just seems like some fun but probably unnecessary superhero movie tech. But like everything in this movie, everything is reused later on. All of this is put in place to set up Ross needing to use this technology later to take down the outgoing weapon cargo ships. Later when Njadaka breaks Claw out of captivity, he wears that horn tribal mask that he stole from the museum earlier. This mask could be a nod to the one Killmonger wears while fighting T'Challa in Reginald Hudlin's Black Panther comic. And when Jadaka tosses a grenade into the room, Black Panther jumps on it to block the explosion. Now this could be another MCU nod. Of course, this is the same act of heroism that Steve Rogers did in Captain America, the first Avenger. When they bring the injured Ross back to Wakanda, Shuri calls him another broken white boy for us to fix. This is a subtle reference to Bucky Barnes. She's setting up the Winter Soldier's cameo in the post credit scene. Next, when when T'Challa confronts Zuri in the garden about Njadaka's ring, we learn the truth about the opening scene. In the memory, Njobu rants about leaders being assassinated, communities being overly drugged and incarcerated. He's referring to the assassinations of civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, Medgar Evers, and unfortunately several others. He also alludes to the mass incarceration of African Americans in the U.S., explored in super depth by Ava DuVernay in her documentary 13th, which you really need to watch. Now, Zuri was described by the filmmakers as as an Obi-Wan Kenobi figure during press junkets, and now having watched the movie, it's interesting to see the parallels. Both men are mystic elder figures who hide the truth from the heroes about their father's dark pasts. Also, both elders sacrifice themselves, leading each hero to let out a boyish, no! Okay, moving on to Njadaka's arrival to the Wakanda throne room. Now at this point, Michael B. Jordan has completely altered the rhythm of this movie. Whereas everyone else speaks in respectful royal tones, his language is more casual. He greets Queen Ramonda by saying, Hey auntie, I think the closest parallel to the way a villain works in a superhero movie is Heath Ledger's The Joker in The Dark Knight. Like The Joker, Njadaka takes over every scene that he's in. He wins over people with actual results instead of just words. And he burns this world's most precious commodity just to make a statement. Most importantly, he drives forward with the philosophy that's better defined than the heroes is. And part of us kind of wants to see him succeed, even though we know that that would be terrible. Like, yes, it's wrong for Njadaka to try to weaponize millions of people worldwide with superior technology to enact some sort of global reverse oppression. But that extremist position ultimately changes T'Challa, who is moved to step away from his isolationist ancestors toward a more open door policy. Just one that's more peaceful and practical than in Jadakas. By the way, that's something that the Joker does too in The Dark Knight. The Joker never really changes as a character, but his extreme anarchist philosophy teaches Batman that villainous pariahs are more effective at mobilizing society to take their security into their own hands, which is why Batman takes on the role of pariah at the end of that movie. Yeah, yeah, I know I'm getting sidetracked here. So let's quickly compare Black Panther to another thing that I love. Daniel Kaluuya actually described this story as Marvel's Game of Thrones. And yeah, you can see how this royal drama echoes the inner family rivalries and battles for thrones in that show. When Njadaka challenges T'Challa back at Warrior Falls, he says the line, every breath you take is mercy from me, which is a direct quote from a Black Panther versus Namor moment in the comics. It it also ends with Njadaka tossing him off the waterfall, which is another thing that he does in the comics. When Njadaka drinks the heart-shaped herb and enters the ancestral plane, he returns to the memory of losing his father. Now it's interesting how we get the shot of him cradling his father crying, and it's staged very similarly to T'Challa's memory of cradling his father's body. I think this parallel is meant to make us empathize with the villain as much as we do the hero, to force ourselves to really think about which of their philosophies is the right one. Now if you look 
closely during this memory, and Jobu's diary features this map of Wakanda and these coordinates. Now, this could be left behind for his young son to find and reach the homeland someday. Or maybe these are the ones that he gave to Claw to break in and steal the vibranium. Anyway, if you enter these coordinates into Google Earth, they actually take you to the heart of Africa, the northeastern corner of the Democratic Republic of Congo near the Ugandan border. Actually, this is almost exactly where on the map that Easter egg appeared in Iron Man 2, hinting at S.H.I.E.L.D.'s awareness of Wakanda back then. When Njadaka returns to the throne room, Kugler frames it with this interesting upside down shot. Now, this disorientation is meant to evoke how upside down this world of Wakanda has become, with this usurper now on the throne. As Njadaka announces his plans, he says the words, the sun will never set on the empire of Wakanda. Now, this is a historical reference to the phrase, the empire on which the sun never sets, originally referring to the Spanish empire in the 1500s, which spanned several hemispheres so that the sun was always up on some part of it. Later on, the phrase was used to describe the empires of the United Kingdom, the US, and Japan. The ex-royal family and Ross retreat to the mountains to seek the help of M'Baku, who delivers this great fake threat to Ross. I'll feed you to my children. Eh, just kidding, we're all vegetarians. Now, this could be a nod to M'Baku's backstory in the comics. His tribe eats the flesh and bathes in the blood of the white gorilla. But yeah, Winston Duke's version is way more relatable and way more fun. And after they revive T'Challa, all the key players confront each other in this final battle. Now, I hate to draw too many parallels between this movie and The Lion King, because guys, not all Africa stories are the same. But yeah, this Black Panther epic return from the dead to challenge the usurper moment definitely evokes Simba's return to face Scar. But really, let's be honest, they're both referencing Shakespeare's Hamlet, in which Hamlet, thought to be killed, returns from the dead, sort of, to face his uncle and usurper, Claudius. In Jadaka shows his own vibranium armor, which was referred to as the Golden Jaguar suit. It's interesting how this gold trim is the exact necklace T'Challa scoffed at earlier, saying the goal was to not be noticed. But Njaka embraces the idea of being noticed, because that's his whole philosophy. He doesn't want to live in secret, he wants to proudly show off his superiority. That idea was also reflected in the design of the mask. Whereas T'Challa's mask has no mouth, evoking his silence and stoicness, Njadaka's mask features an open roaring mouth with gnashing teeth, implying his character's brashness. During this battle, we see the warriors of the border tribe assemble their cloaks into a shield wall. This is reminiscent of the ancient Roman soldier formation called a phalanx, where they assembled their shields into a wall to close in on enemies and block arrow fire. We also see Black Panther take down one of the border tribe's rhinos, which is an image from the comics. Once T'Challa defeats Ndjaka on the train platform, he brings him out to see the sunset. We actually saw T'Challa exercise this kind of mercy at the end of the Captain America Civil War with Baron Zemo. But this also closes out two parts of Ndjaka's arc. For one, it allows him to finally see the Wakandan sunset that his father promised him. But it also calls back his promise that the sun would never set on the empire of Wakanda. Here, the sun is indeed setting on Wakanda and Njadaka's empire was never meant to be. His final words are so powerful. Bury me in the ocean with my ancestors that jumped from the ships. They knew that death was better than bondage. In a few short words, Njadaka links the history of the African slave trade with the mass incarceration of America today. He's reminding T'Challa that although he lost this battle, those crimes of humanity have never truly been resolved. And you could argue that that argument ultimately wins the war. And the lessons he learns from Njadaka and Nakia eventually lead him back to the starting place of Njadaka's journey and this movie, Oakland. But now we see that T'Challa has started to make improvements. The old bottomed out milk crate has been replaced by a new hoop. And he explains to Shuri that the old project will be turned into an outreach center. Ryan Coogler is suggesting that the answer isn't violence or revenge. The the answer is redirecting our energies back into the communities to bring them up with education and sharing of resources. The symmetry of this closing image was so important to Kugler that he actually moved the movie's original ending, T'Challa's powerful speech to the UN, to the mid credits scene. Instead, he leaves us with this, this young boy who sees T'Challa's Wakandan ship and marvels at him. By the way, this actor is Alex Hibbert. He played the young version of Chiron in Moonlight. Here, he represents the younger generation of youths who now have a hero to look up to and a positive example of what makes the best superheroes heroic. A question I have for you guys. For a Black Panther sequel, who would you rather it follow? T'Challa or another character like Shuri or M'Baku? Comment and tell me your thoughts down below. Tweet me directly at EA Voss and follow New Rockstars on Twitter at New Rockstars for updates on our videos. And of course, subscribe to New Rockstars for more Black Panther analysis. There's really so much to talk about with this movie. Keep an eye out for more videos that we're gonna do about the music of the movie, as well as our thoughts on that mystery of where the final Infinity Stone is. And if you really like us and wanna help us grow, you can contribute to this channel on Patreon. Big thanks to all of our donors, especially Kenny Smith. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye.